And I want to go to Liberal MP Zoe McKenzie now, who joins us live from Melbourne. And uh, you've had a, a, a long career based in the trade space, Zoe. Uh, this goes into defence uh, and missile capabilities, of course, but surely the one thing we could say is we need to know that our federal government our, and our defence experts are looking very closely at this capability and whether or not it would be useful for Australia to have it. Look, certainly we should, Chris, but I, as you say, don't want to intervene in what sounds like it's a commercial inconfidence deal at this point in time, not necessarily one that the Australian government has stepped into. You are right. I did lose quite a few years of my life negotiating that free trade agree a free trade agreement with China, uh, which China then, you know, turned around and didn't quite abide by the rule of the law that was set out in that agreement for the last couple of years. One good thing that's come out of the last 24 hours has been a resumption of our stability in terms of trade. That is a good thing, uh, one that we should all welcome. You know, we do very well as a country here. We have a vast trade surplus with China, one of very few countries who does that. Uh, so that is a good thing and that is something to come out of the last 24 hours. So are you telling us then that the visit of Chinese Premier Chung Li has been successful? Look, I think it's been good insofar as it has reiterated that, that things are resuming back to where they were before. So we did one of the best trade deals. The coalition did one of the best trade deals that China had granted, and it was finalised in 2015, operationalised in 2016, uh, but then China withdrew from the terms of that agreement uh, shortly after 2020. So it's been problematic for our producers, our agriculture in particular, our winemakers. So they are very relieved to see a return to normal trade uh, in most industries, except for lobster. I haven't watched what's happening in Perth today to see whether that has actually changed overnight. Uh, but nevertheless, I think in that respect, trade back to normal, good. There are many other matters that we can and must continue to raise. One thing I have noticed with the Prime Minister in the last 24 hours is he's very good at huffing and puffing after the fact, not very good at speaking plainly to our Chinese friends in relation to issues relating to defence, issues relating to human rights, issues relating to Chinese-Australian Chang Lei uh, and what she went through in China. So he's very good at, at pointing the finger, but only once people are out of town. Yeah, once uh, it's all been drawn to his attention he's, uh, attention, he's been embarrassed by it. And as you say, they're out of town. Now, what concerns me about this so-called stabilisation, though, is we've stabilised the relationship in a pretty unhealthy place, one where they've slapped punitive tariffs and bans on us over a number of years and now we're supposed to be grateful that those punitive, unwarranted uh, sanctions against us are lifted. And yet they've left some in place. The bans on lobster and some meat exporters are still punitive. There's no reason for them. And how can we say that we're at all satisfied with the way China's treating us while they're still treating us that way? So, interestingly, if it weren't for the fact that the WTO was in complete chaos in terms of its dispute resolution, we would have taken China to the WTO. We had actually um, made moves in that direction under the previous coalition government to basically say they are not abiding by the terms of the agreement that they settled with us. We opened up vast parts of the Australian market to China investment uh, and to Chinese trade. Uh, and in return, we expected the terms of that agreement to be respected, and they were not. Uh, obviously, this government has taken a different approach. It's been far more softly, softly, far more um, uh, willing to please, one might say, uh, and that has been different. Nevertheless, I know our producers, particularly my producers here, who do export to China, are grateful for a degree of stabilisation. Now, interesting economic news today with the Reserve Bank Governor telling us that rates are going to stay on hold, but she's warning, really, that they had a look at increasing interest rates again. She's warning us not to expect interest rates to come down quickly. She's warning that the, 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 the gap to avoid another interest rate rise is narrowing. And she's pointing the finger of blame, uh, rather obviously, as many of us would, at... at uh, pro prolific spending by governments, federal and state. There's just this spending uh, binge going on, debt fueled that's fueling inflation. Isn't this a terrible time then for politicians and bureaucrats to get a substantial pay rise when we're dealing with the cost of living crisis that's actually being fueled by those same politicians? So, interestingly, I did listen to the RBA Governor's press conference this afternoon and I agree with you, none of it would have filled you with confidence. It is clear she is dancing a very delicate line indeed. Uh, there have been suggestions from the RBA that have come out in questions that have been answered in the last week suggesting they thought there was um, expansionary pressure 
uh, from the last budget. And so they are doing the difficult job that, frankly, the government is not willing to do, which is to try and dampen uh, inflation in this economy. Now, you raised the point of uh, wages today. I haven't looked at that in detail, uh, and I'm ass assured that that would be something the Remuneration Tribunal has recommended. But let me tell you, I know everyone in my electorate is doing it tough. I've got more closed shops down on our main street than I've seen for years. I've got people closing their small businesses, small businesses that have been thriving for 40 years. It's just got too hard. Their businesses are guaranteed by their home loans. Their home loans are up $25,000 a year. No yep. one has got money like that. The government so, said today so, people are reaching into their mortgages just to keep so food on the table. So it's not a great time for politicians to get a 3.5% wage rise. But tell me this one. Um, you've had a lot of experience working with the public sector. Uh, the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet now is going to be paid over a million dollars a year. Now, people say, oh, you can, you can earn more than that in the, in, in, the, in the private sector. Well, sure, let him go. What is the justification for paying a public servant more than a million dollars a year to run a government department when the Prime Minister's pay is now going up over $600,000 uh, this time around? Why should any public servant get paid more than the Prime Minister? It seems incongruous. It does seem in Congress, but that has been the tradition for a very long time now. Like I remember in, in John Howard's era that the, the head of the public service was paid more. Um, as I used to say to people who would say to me, thinking of a political career, you don't get paid much. I said, the good news is you've got no spare time in which to spend it. So that's really the, <laughs> yes. the only thing you can say in favour of, of uh, parliamentary um, salaries. But nevertheless, it's it's been a long-standing fact that the public servants at the top get paid more than the, than the actual parliamentary people. And that's, you know, we live with that, we accept it, we move on.